I'm going to continue in my uh, kind of series preparing for Easter. Uh, the premise of the series has really been, um, I believe those who experienced Easter, who understood the death and resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ, knew him best. And so we've been looking at the Gospel of John. It was a Gospel that was written by John specifically to defend the nature and character of Christ. The God who is fully man and fully God. That Jesus was that incarnate uh, glory of God who made his flesh among us. And uh, we've been looking at some ways in which John described him. Um, John, he's a theme guy. He, there's things that occur several times. Um, he wrote the gospel. He wrote some uh, letters. 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. And he also wrote the book of Revelation. And when we read these books that were all penned by him, we can see some consistencies throughout them. One of the things that's unique in John's gospel are the words, I am. And we talked about some of the I am. We're going to know who Jesus Christ is. If I ask you who you are, you're going to say, I am this and I am that, right? I'm a man, I'm a father, I'm a pastor, I'm this, or I'm that, I'm a man. You know, that's how we describe ourselves. And we're looking at these phrases that Jesus determined, these phrases that Jesus used to describe himself, to reveal his nature to those who are following. And so we looked at... Uh, one that was maybe a little bit unique in this series, the beginning we started with when Jesus declared, I am. When he was walking on the water and people asked him, the disciples cried out in the boat, who is that out there? And he said, I am. When they, well, when they were accusing him or when they were uh, talking to him about Abraham, he said, even before Abraham was, I am. When he was being arrested in the garden, he cried out, I am, declaring that he is, is God. That's what we looked at. Uh, the first one that came in, in the book of John, John chapter 6, where Jesus says that I am the bread of life. We looked at how that fit in the equation. But he's really telling us in that, not necessarily about, about man or anything else, but a spiritual lens that we can do things through. So today I want to continue that. We're going to be in John chapter 8, uh, specifically verse 12, if you want to get ahead of me. But before I get there, I want to tell you what comes before that. Because... John chapter 8, verse 12 is kind of an interesting verse. It just kind of comes out of nowhere. I mean, really, kind of when you look at it, it's kind of a funny start. It's kind of, anyway, some context on what's going on. And to find the context of John 8, we actually got to look at John 7. Um, because the events that are taking place in John chapter 8, they began in John chapter 7. John chapter 7 begins, it says that Jesus was going to the tabernacle, or he was going to the temple for the Feast of Tabernacles. And so it's important for us, I think, the context of what this is. Interestingly enough, last week's I Am statement actually took place, place during the Feast of Passover. This week takes place during the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles, I know most of us were well rehearsed on our Jewish uh, feast, and so we all know, so I'll just briefly <coughs> explain what it was about. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles was a celebration. Uh, sometimes they call it the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tents. And what Jews do is it's a reminder of their time in the wilderness. Who wants to be reminded of their time in the wilderness? That's what we're celebrating. Actually, even today, there's some sects of Jews that literally put tents in their backyard and they live in tents for a week. Now, I'm sure they still go inside to go to the bathroom and stuff. You know, we're American, you know, I mean, whatever, we're modern people. But, but they're doing it to remind themselves of their time in the wilderness. It was a feast, and we remember the time in the wilderness not because of the wilderness, but because of God's, specifically, his protection and his provision in the wilderness. That this was a season where for 40 years they were wandering, for 40 years they had nothing, yet God continually provided, he continually protected, he continually guided them, he continually showed them where to go while they were in the wilderness. They were not without God. And so they have this festival where they celebrate this. So Jesus goes to the tabernacle, but what happens when Jesus goes to the tabernacle typically? Pharisees argue with Jesus. I mean, that's kind of what happens in John chapter 7. They start arguing with him, questioning him. He makes some claims. They don't like his claims. That's normal. John chapter 8. I'm going to begin in verse 2 of John chapter, chapter 8. It kind of begins in the shadow of this, this glorious celebration. Jesus has his confrontation. He leaves. 
Uh, it says in John chapter 1, he goes to the Mount of Olives. He kind of gets away from the situation. And in verse 2, he's, he appears again at dawn. He appears again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. He sat down to teach them. So even though the Pharisees didn't like Jesus, the people were still compelled by him. And they were still coming to hear from him uh, to teach. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And they made her stand before the group. And they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and began to start to write on the ground with his feet. So when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said, Let that, that any, any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stood down and he wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. I love the way they went. The older ones first, until Jesus was, only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and he asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. So this moment that's happening before John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus is in the temple. He comes back to teach. He comes back to be there in the temple. Um, the side note of the end of the Feast of, of Tabernacles is that the, the people celebrate. Now, this is hard for us to consider. They celebrate the Torah. They have the, the end of the festival is a glorious celebration of God's law. When was the last time... You read the book of Exodus and you just started praising God for his law. I mean, when we read the book of Deuteronomy, I mean, we read the law that, that God gave. Well, the end of this festival was, was a celebration of the law. And again, because of our lens, we look at the law in the wrong perspective. But for a Jew, the law was the fullness of God's provision and protection. For a Jew, the law was the way in which they could be saved, the way in which they could get out of their wilderness. It had to come through adherence to the law. But what's compelling is, what do the Pharisees bring? Now, they've come up with a plot, so Jesus must have really made a man. They spent all night stewing, coming up with the way. How are we going to get there? And they happen to find this one lady who got caught in adultery. Now, can you imagine being this poor woman? Where do they bring her? The plan is we're going to take her. They don't care for humiliating her. They don't care how big the crowd is that Jesus has. They're going to take her before Jesus, and they're going to tell the whole world her sin. And what do they use when they tell them her sin? Moses says, remember the Torah that we're celebrating it's, it's highly revered and highly seen. Jesus can't go against the law right now. I mean, if there's one way to try to use what is, is so prominent, what everybody's so excited about, we're going to say, hey, but, but Moses says, if a woman is caught like this, we need to do what? We need to kill her. What say you, Jesus? I'd love to know what he was writing and saying. One of those ones chosen, I'm sure, writes some really good things there. I'd love to know what he was writing and saying. And Jesus looks up. And he doesn't. He doesn't break the law. He doesn't go against the law of Moses. But he says this phrase, whoever, whoever among you has never sinned, let me go ahead and throw the first stuff. I bet those Pharisees had stones in their pockets. They probably had bags of stones to sell. Bags of stones to sell, not stones to sell. Bag of stones to sell. I mean, this was the moment, and I can just picture in my mind people dropping the stones and walking away. And in the lens of all of this, the Feast of Tabernacles, the celebration of the Torah, the teaching of Jesus, the accusation of the Pharisees. John chapter 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again, 
to the people. The next thing he says, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It's such an interesting analogy. It's such a weird phrase. John loves to talk about light and darkness. That's one of his themes. Read the books. I mean, I could talk about it for hours. Uh, I was really struggling hearing things down in my sermon because of all the places John talks about light and dark. Because when I want to figure out what someone's saying in the gospel, if I read a word and I'm curious as to what they think that word means, I look at where they write in other places because that's the most logical way for me to figure out how they use it. John uses light all over the place. It's in the gospel. It's in the, the, the epistles, the, the letters that he wrote. It's in the book of Revelation. So what is Jesus declaring? Well, I'm the light of the world. Well, what does that mean? What was Jesus saying in this moment? Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Oh, a couple months ago, I guess, Pastor Tara started after-school program. And what she's been doing with the after-school program is she's been teaching the kids the days of creation. So do you know what God created on day one? That's the terror. What did God create on day one? Light. light. He created light on day one, right? Does anyone know when God created the sun and the moon to govern the day and the night? Day four. So Pastor Terry said, what do you think? She says, is it fair for me to say? We often say when we read that, God created light. What do we picture? The lights in the room. The illumination, this physical light that we see in the room. What do you think it is that God might have created. Because see, the sun didn't come, and the moon didn't come, and the stars didn't come till day four. So for three days, what was the light that God created? I mean, it's simple to think about light in the context of this world. It's simple to think about light when we think of darkness in the physical realm. But there was something spiritual. There was something eternal. There was something profound that God created on that first day. What did he create? Found this in a study. Light in the Jewish Bible was not emitted by any earthly or heavenly source. Heavenly meaning like sun, moon, and stars. It's rather a product of divinity or the divine spark attributed to those who are sanctified. Light is used to symbolize wisdom, morality, righteousness, divine living. So when Jesus is speaking in this moment, what was that woman dealing with? She was dealing with physical darkness, right? What was the cause of her physical darkness? It wasn't the Pharisees. It was her sin. <coughs> and because of her sin, she was, because of herself, she was in a place of darkness. Because of her choice, because of what she chose to do, knowing the law, she was bound by the law, so we must assume she was Jewish. This is just me. <coughs> she made a choice to break the law of God. That choice brought sin in her life. The sin in her life caused her to be destined to death. Can you imagine the darkness in that moment? I don't know when the Pharisees caught this woman. I don't know how long she's been dealing with the, the fear of condemnation. Condemnation that she caused. I'm sure when she came to that crowd, she expected to meet her maker. When she came that day, <coughs> She knew the result of the moment that was coming. And Jesus spoke the words, Let him who is without sin face the first step. Can you imagine? Just picture the darkness moving the light. When the darkness was the condemnation of your choices, when the darkness was what's about to come, when you're standing, I'm guessing this woman wasn't looking anybody in the eyes, 
but she's looking all around at all the rocks that are laying on the ground, seeing what each one of them is going to do to her physical body. Can you imagine the freedom? Can you imagine the joy? Can you imagine the hope she felt when Jesus spoke those words and she watched the old ones begin to walk away? for ourselves. There's a darkness that we cause that is called sin that we choose willingly even knowing we're not supposed to do. There's a darkness that condemns us. It condemns us to death. That's eternal separation from God. But Jesus Christ came to say, I'm the light of the world. You no longer have to be defined by that darkness, but I am the light. There is a way that can be found in me. Yes, he told that woman, Walt well, used the word today, he told that woman she had to repent, right? She couldn't continue in her choices. She couldn't continue in her sin. He said, repent and believe. Because now there was light, there was a way. Pastor Tara, she said she taught the kids that wisdom, this is what she taught. I, I agree with it, I think it's good. Our, our light in the Old Testament was wisdom. I believe light is the way of God. I believe that's what he's doing. He's illuminating a divine path for our lives. I believe he's illuminating a divine path for everyone's lives. But there's a God of this age who has blinded eyes. And many of us, we want to stay in the darkness. When I sleep, I like it to be dark. We've got blackout curtains plus another set of curtains behind the blackout curtains. Because I don't want, and don't tell me anything you need to be up when the sun comes up. Sometimes I don't get up when the sun comes up. Okay, KC, I'm sorry. <laughs> I tell you what, I'll do whatever it takes to stay in the darkness when I want to stay in the darkness. Sometimes we live the same way. The light is shining, but we're doing whatever it takes to stay in the darkness. There's wisdom that's crying out but saying, you know what you're doing isn't his way. You know where you are isn't what he wants. There's wisdom that is speaking to you through the spirit of God, that's speaking to you through the words of others, but you are intentionally keeping the blanket over your head with the curtains up because nothing is going to get you out of your darkness. John, several times he talks about light. First John Chapter three or chapter one, verse three says, "Through him all things were made. Nothing was made that that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it." Someone needs to underline that phrase. God created you with a purpose. That purpose is the eternal life that He's created you to live. He's illuminating life. He's illuminating light for your life. And the darkness cannot overcome it. It has not overcome it. Look at what he says in John. We know these verses. John chapter 3. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believed in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not... What was the issue with the woman? She was condemned. She was condemned by herself and she was condemned by men. Whoever believes in Jesus Christ is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned in darkness already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. This is the answer. Light has come into this world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come to light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly what they have done and what has been done in the sight of God. So this woman was in darkness because of herself. I want to look at another situation where we see darkness in the book of John. John chapter 9. Verse 1 says, as he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who said 
this man or his parents that he was born blind? Can you imagine? You ever been told? Watch our words sometimes. This guy had been blind his whole life. And the first question people were asking is, who did this to him? Was it him or his parents that condemned him? Was it him or his parents that caused him to be in this darkness? You see, the woman, she made a choice to be in, in darkness. This man, Jesus says what? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happens to the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of uh, Siloam. This means sin. So the man went, washed, and came home sick. See, the woman before, she was condemned because of her choice. And Jesus Christ said, I'm the light of the world, and she went away transformed. This man, he was condemned not because of his choice, but because of this world. Because it happens. We live in a fallen and broken world. And there's sin and the effect of sin, not because we've done it, but because we live in the brokenness of this world. And he wasn't, he wasn't condemned because of himself. He was condemned because of, of the fallenness of this world. And Jesus addressed that. He spit on the ground. He put the mud in the man's eyes, and the man could see. He was set free because of the light of the world. Jesus Christ said, I'm the light of the world. Sometimes we're in darkness because of ourselves. Sometimes we're in darkness because of this world. But we have a choice on whether we recognize what the true light is. John chapter 12, the last one I want to look at, the crowd spoke up. We heard from the law uh, that the Christ will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Who are you? What's your identity? Jesus told them you're going to have the light just a little while longer. While you have the light before darkness overtakes you, walk, whoever walks in the dark does not know where the Lord is. Leave you in the light while you have the light till you to become children of the light. You know, in, in, in the book of, of Matthew, and I think it's a Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said to the people, you are salt and our identity becomes him. We're salt and light in this world. When we have a choice, you know, some of us are in darkness because of ourselves. Some of us are in darkness because of the world. But we have a choice on whether we remain in the darkness. We have a choice. Do we want to be children of the darkness or do we want to be children of the light? That choice comes through Jesus Christ. Believe the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. When he finished speaking, Jesus left, and he hid himself from them. That's a funny picture for me. He's a light of the world inside of himself, but that's besides the point. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. And later on, verse 46, he said, I've come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. There's no one who has to stay in the darkness. There's no one who has to stay condemned by men, condemned by sin. There's no one who has to stay condemned by sickness or, or the condemned by this world. Because Jesus Christ has come. And when he came, he said, I am the light of the world. He came to reveal that light to everyone. That we would know the way in which we should live. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For God said, let light shine out of darkness, and made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory to save the face of Christ. This is the message it says in 1 John chapter 1. We have heard from him and declared you God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. We have a choice. He's revealed who he is. We live as children. We should live as children of the light. One last verse, and I'm finished. Ephesians chapter 5. For you were once in the darkness, but now you are in, now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Find out what pleases 
world. Jesus Christ came to reveal himself as the light of the world so we would no longer have to live condemned. This morning, we have a choice. This morning, we have an opportunity to say, where do I want to remain? You can remain in the darkness. Plenty of people who heard Jesus teach this, what did he say? They saw signs and wonders, and they still refused to believe. I get it. Sometimes it's fun in the darkness. Sometimes it's comfortable in the darkness. Sometimes it's easy in the darkness. But we have a choice. Jesus Christ has come in his life. You guys can come on. He's come as light. His nature is that there is a wise path. There is wisdom and righteousness for you to walk on. Will you allow him? How did Jesus, how did God lead the Israelites in the wilderness? You remember? There was a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. He led by his light in the wilderness. I believe that God is crying out. He wants to lead you. He wants to free you. He wants to bring light in whatever situation you're facing. But again, it comes back. Last week we said it. This week we'll say it. Every week we'll say it. It comes back to you. It comes back to me. Will I receive the light and be transformed by the light? Will I allow myself to become a child of the light? Or will I just be a hider from the light? It's your choice. Heavenly Father, this morning, we thank you for this time. Oh, we thank you for the word of Jesus Christ and the revelation of him. God, in the beginning, when you created all that was, you created light, and you called it good. Jesus Christ said, I'm the light and the giver of life. Eternal life is the light. Knowing I'm no longer judged by this world. I'm no longer condemned by my choices. I'm no longer defined by my peers. Because I have an eternal life that comes through Jesus Christ. God had told that woman all she had to do was believe. God, you're telling us today all we have to do to get out of the darkness is simply believe. Believe what? Believe in who Jesus Christ is. The Son of God who came to this world, for God so loved the world. He sent His Son to die. Recognizing that sin has consequences, that sin needs to be condemned to die. But Jesus Christ came to take the fullness of that punishment on Himself. So I'm no longer temporary. I'm now eternal. I'm no longer defined by faults but I'm defined by the victory of the cross of Jesus Christ. Help us today to believe. I pray, God, that we would be children of the light. That our lives then become a reflection of your light. Help us to receive. I guess I'll, I'll pray for the food too because I know we're really excited about that. Um, we got to cut stuff and get stuff ready up in a while. I want an opportunity to pray today. If you need, if you need prayer, pray today. Specifically, if you need prayer because you feel like you've been surrounded by darkness and you just want to be set free from that, I want to pray the light of the world in your life. If you're not comfortable coming forward, maybe there's someone in the room you're comfortable praying with, go to that and ask them to pray. If there's other needs or situations, if there's other stuff in their life, if you feel condemned or you feel called out by people or there's circumstances that seem to be defining you, I want to stand with you as a child of the light to bring light in the midst of your circumstances. Because God's not called us to live in darkness. Darkness in our minds, darkness in our homes, 
Don't diss our staff. I say the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you and grant you his peace. And then you see Jesus Christ, the light of the world. We'll sing, and, and if you want to respond, I'll be up here to pray. He's the light of the world. Amen. We live in light. Amen? Amen. We're not defined by darkness. We're defined by the light of the world.